much. Thank you, Lazaro. Uh -huh. Hello. Is this thing working? Hello. All right. Yeah, I, I have the impression that my voice is not going through the microphone. What's a good thing? Though? So, yeah, yesterday I was talking to you guys about ultra-fast spectroscopy. Supposedly I was speaking so ultra-fast that uh, people were, well, what? If you didn't sleep that much yesterday, when I mean didn't sleep that much, I mean during my, my talk, you may understand what I'm going to talk about today. So yesterday, we did talk about uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy. And uh, basically, you can just walk outside of this room, go to my lab, and take data and publish a paper. Just make sure I'm a co-author. But uh, right now, I'm going to tell you what kind of studies we can do. So basically, I took one hour to teach you and two hours to do some advertisement of my group. That's basically what I'm going to do. So as I talked to you yesterday, we can study all these kind of things using ultraviolet spectroscopy. There is a bunch of other things, spin, uh, spin dynamics and things like that that I don't do, so I'm not going to talk about it. But uh, uh, what I want to focus is basically on this, nanomaterials. So this paper came out, I, I think, like two or three years ago uh, by these guys at uh, Case Western University. This is a perspective in JPCL saying, contribution of pentosecond laser spectroscopy to the development of advanced up electronic nanomaterials. So when you do ultrafast spectroscopy, like I told you yesterday, you can learn interesting physics, you can gain a Nobel Prize, but also you can contribute to the no development of novel of the electronic devices. And uh, particularly, I'm interested in nanomaterials because they are beautiful. They are pretty cool. They are nice. And I'll prove to you that they are beautiful. Let's see. Look. <laughs> no, wait. Uh, I have this picture. Someone might ask me, why you have this picture there? Uh, actually, it's for a good reason. It's not because of her, but because of her hair. All right? If you look at her hair, close enough, you're going to see something like this. And this thing here is about 60 microns. So if you pull a hair and look at your hair, that's about 60 microns. All right? It's thicker than an optical fiber. All right? I think Paulo has talked to you about it yesterday or whatever. I don't know. Probably you guys know about optical fiber. And if I take a nanomaterial and uh, multiply its size by about 10 times and compare it to her hair, it's going to be like that. But that I need to 10,000 times, sorry. OK? So they are pretty tiny. When I say tiny, I mean they are like up to like 10 nanometers in size. And uh, they don't need to be like spherical like this. They can be like rods. They can be looking like this kind of strange thing right here. They can be core shell. And that can be used for a series of novel applications. For example, here I have three LEDs made out of it. Okay, one emitting the green, one in blue, and one in red. And in fact, if you buy some new Sony TV, you probably has quantum dot inside. So the LED is based in quantum dot. I think Samsung also. And uh, if you remember yesterday, for those that was that were not sleeping, you can remember that I said, all right, things that happen in nature, especially in small atoms and molecules, they are fast. And quantum dot, come on, this is like 10 nanometer. They're tiny, all right? So things that happen inside of these guys, they're typically fast. If they are fast, we need to be ultra fast. So that's why we use this type of technique to understand what's going on inside of this. So today, I want to go through several topics that we've been studying, from fundamental physics to application using ultra fast spectroscopy to actually help in development of novel optoelectronic devices, and also to learn some new physics. So before continuing, I just wanted to introduce you these guys, all right? And uh, if you take a bulk semiconductor, you have this dense of states that's beautiful. If you have a quantum well, it's going to look like a staircase. And when you go to one thing we call quantum dot, okay, you start to have discrete 
uh, levels. And for those of you that have uh, studied quantum mechanics sometime in your life, you guys have probably solved the, the spherical potential or the, the, the particle in a box, things like that. When you do this, what happens? You get discrete states, okay? And the smaller is the box, what happens to the states? They increase, right? So quantum is basically that. Like, that's a very interesting material for you to study quantum mechanics. So if you think about the potential well problem, that's what happened. And if you do the first order approximation, the band gap go once over, over R squared. That's exactly what you get when you solve the spherical potential problem, okay? And uh, that's so true that if I take, for example, cad selenite, which has a band gap at about 800 nanometer, and the emission would not see unless you have pretty good eyes, uh, I can confine it and make it emit all the way from the red to the blue, simply by increasing the band gap here, okay? So I can take the same material and tune where it emits. And uh, more than that, I can make the transitions discrete, and that changes a lot the electronic property. And how we understand that using ultrafast spectroscopy? Uh, yes? Oh, yeah, again. There you go. All right. So here I have a chart where it shows, like, for example, let's say this guy over here, who is this? Indium, no, not, not this one, Let, lead telluride. It goes from all the way from here, if you confine, goes um, almost to 3 electron volt. So you see, I can tune the band gap quite a lot. And here is actually some sample we, we, we studied. This is lead sulfide. You see, I can have it, the band gap all the way here from 700 nanometer all the way to 1.8 micro, simply by changing size, okay? And uh, here is some STS we did a couple years ago, uh, three years ago. Uh, and we see actually the states. And remember the thing I was telling you that uh, the states are going to spread apart when you make it smaller? That's proven here. This is a scanning, uh, what's that? Scanning, uh, I forgot now the name of it. STS. It's scanning tunneling um, spectroscopy. <sighs> So we could see, actually, the, the states are spreading apart. So what they told you in quantum mechanics, actually, they were not lying. It actually happens, all right? So in this guy, because they are tiny, because we can engineer the way the electrons behave, they seem pretty fun because they have broad absorption. If you look here, it starts absorbing here and go. It has narrow emission. Uh, well, trust me. Uh, you can tune the color. They have high PL quantum yield. You can change the surface. You can, you can like do whatever you want, basically. And according to the people in the chemistry, they say that's pretty easy to make. They're cheap to make. And if you want to make a device out of it, you don't want something very expensive. Uh, and uh, we can get something for free out of it because, again, delta X, delta P has to be more than 80 bar over 2. All right? It's, we know that. And uh, if the shrink is so tiny, what happened? Delta X is pretty tiny, so delta P can be large. So it means that the momentum relaxation is relaxed. Listen, I'm not saying that there is no momentum conservation, okay? If I say that, you can tear apart my diploma. But what I'm saying is that it's relaxed, all right? So we don't, we, you really don't know what the momentum is. So you don't know what you need to conserve. So it makes your life easy. Uh, we can have, for example, you can slow down intraband relaxation. And uh, there is one thing here that I find to be pretty interesting, is that we can increase Coulomb interaction. You guys that have done some uh, basic courses in physics know that the Coulomb interaction goes well, no, the potential goes one over R. So if the electrons are too close to each other, this one over R is going to explode, right? So the Coulomb interaction starts to be very important. And uh, we're going to see how this influences real life. So, First thing I want to show to you when I do uh, ultrafast spectroscopy with this type of material is basically, remember the transient absorption experiment I showed yesterday? The one you come with a strong beam and then a weak one and probe what, what happened. The, you probe the changes that happened in the material. So this is a five nanometer lead sulfide quantum dot, all right? So we have a sample with a bunch of lead sulfide quantum dots. 
and you might be wondering what uh, the sample looks like. It's a little cuvette with a dark liquid because this has, for example, hexane, and the quantum dots are dispersed on, top, on, on, on this hexane to make our life easy to study. So if I come with a pump right here, OK? You see, this is the first transition. If I come with a pump right there, I'm going to take the electrons, oops, sorry, and put up there to this first transition. And that's all I get. So if I measure, I get the saturation of the, the absorption there, and then it decays over time. Now, if I want to do something fancier, I can pump over here, much higher states. And then when I probe right here, I see a different dynamics. Look, no, this, go, this guy goes to 100 picoseconds. This guy goes only to six picoseconds. You see how it decays much faster? And then if I keep pumping right there and I probe, oops, oh, sorry. And if I probe right here, I see a different type of behavior. And if I probe right here, instead of seeing this changing quite fast, I see this change quite slow. You see, rising quite slow. So I start seeing different dynamics. So in other words, if I take and pump it right here and the probe all the way around, I could see some curve that goes, oh, man, I, I, I made so much. OK, I can see something like this. See, when I first start, 0 0.2 picosecond. That's like 200 femtosecond, right after I pump it. Look, I see a huge change in absorption here. Absorption gets smaller. You see? I'm sorry, the absorption gets smaller here, gets larger here, gets smaller here, gets larger here again. And then as the time goes by, after like three picoseconds, you see? This guy dies, this guy starts to recover, this guy is recover, and look at this guy. Increases quite a lot. So do you guys, can anyone, someone guess why is this coming down and this is going up? I can use this one also. It has, has also the, the schematic. So basically, what, what we're doing is simple. We're taking the electrons, putting it up there. We're pumping it higher level, OK? So in the very first few picoseconds, it's going to populate a higher level state. As we keep probing at different levels, we start seeing the electrons. Oh, first of all, as it up, is up there, what it causes, it causes a column of repulsion, which makes the energy states shift. So the whole band gap comes to lower energy. So we start having more absorption here, because you see, if I translate this curve, the black curve, to lower energy, you're going to have more absorption here and more absorption here. That's why you see this increasing absorption. And, but why you see this bleaching here and there? Because here, you're populating this, this state. So we actually find out where there is a state. And as the time goes by, basically, this is this state. The electrons, actually, they will fall to this state. As it falls to this state, it starts populating this and depopulate that. So as it comes down here, it goes up there. So basically, what we're seeing in real time here is the electrons moving from one state to another with uh, one picosecond resolution, less than that, 100 femtosecond resolution. So the whole time for this to happen is about uh, 700 femtosecond. Okay, so with this technique, we can actually monitor where the electron is going real time. We can really see it moving from here up there. So. Someone yesterday asked me, oh, you can, can, can you look at to charge transfer? Of course, because charge transfer is much slower than this, typically. If we can do this with a 700 femtosecond, charge transfer 10 picosecond, we could see it easily. So, and note, yesterday I mentioned to you about uh, doing spectroscopy rather than doing single wavelength. If I do single wavelength, I have no information at all. Like, if I would do single wavelength here, all I could do is tell you the dynamics on the first excited state. I would not do, for example, I would not be able to tell you all the electrons doing. Okay? 
over time. So we can, for example, solve some physics problem. Like when you compare different materials, I can see how long does it take to populate. Once I excite it to the P level and I probe it to the S level, I can see how long does it take to populate the S level here, here, and here. For example, for lead sulfide, lead selenide, and lead tetrahyde. And I can see, for example, what is the, the cooling rate for each one of them. I can compare materials. Okay? And this actually has to do with uh, the electron phone interaction. And actually, if you run the math, you're going to see that the coupling for lead sulfide is larger than for lead selenide, which is larger for lead tetrahyde. So we can, for example, confirm theories with this. Uh, we can see also how this happens in one single material, but changing size. Remember when I told you when you change size, we have uh, a problem that changes the, the electronic structure. If we do that for several sizes of lead sulfide, for example, we can see that the population of the S level, once you, populate, once you put the electron in a very higher up state, goes from something about 1.5 picosecond all the way to 0 0.3 picosecond. If we do a fitting here, uh, uh, sorry, a plot here of the energy loss rate versus 1 over R, we see that you lose the electron, it actually falls down much faster for a smaller quantum dot. And that's pretty cool because uh, when you make the quantum dots smaller, the energy levels become bigger. One could think, oh, you're going to have a, a, a bottleneck effect for the funnel because you have a huge gap to jump. But in fact, we see it different. We were actually we were hoping to see something like this, but we see something like this. Okay? And there's much more physics to learn when you see something that does not go what, with what you expect. So that's pretty interesting. So this, listen, look, we're going somewhere from 0 0.3 picos femtosecond to 1.5 picosecond. So that's like the resolution we can have. So we can see the electron moving. Well, but then the electron gets to the band edge, all right? Gets to the, the first excited state. So what does it do there? And uh, I mentioned to you about Coulomb interaction, right? So imagine you have a huge quantum dot like this. All right? I go generate one exciton, and this exciton sits right there. All right? And then I generate a second exciton, and this guy was going to sit right there. They're going to see each other, but they're far away from each other. So, okay, they're going to see, but they don't care. But then you make this quantum dot very tiny. Make it smaller, it's going to turn to the blue, right? It's nice, isn't it? Spent, I spent so much time doing that yesterday. So it goes to the blue. And uh, when I generate the first exciton, it's going to be there. If I excite another exciton, it's going to be right on top. So they are forced to see each other. You know? There's no choice. You have to see each other. That's why I say when you get married, you get home, you have to see each other. <laughs> that's basically it. So that's, that's the point. They're going to interact. And what's going to happen? They come too close to each other. Coulomb interaction gets stronger. And there is one type of interaction. It's called OG, which is quite interesting for us. Why is that interesting? First, because we can measure. We have ultra-fast spectroscopy too. And they are pretty fast. See, this is one example of doing transient photoluminescence. Here, we excite the sample. And uh, we measure the photoluminescence over time. And if we excite the sample with very little power, OK, so that no single dot will absorb more than two photons. So I have, at most, one exciton per quantum dot. I see the photoluminescence pretty flat, OK? If I do the same transient absorption, I would see also the transient absorption pretty flat within one nanosecond time scale, OK? Of course, if I wait like 20 nanoseconds, I see it decaying because it has a lifetime. But then I keep cr cranking up the power, increase the power. Eventually, one dot is going to absorb more than two, or at least two photons. If it does it, you start seeing a fast component showing up, and then keeps the same. And then you keep increasing, this fast component increases. You see? 
in this fast component. It's basically this axiom, seeing this axiom. And instead of they come down together and emitting two photons, no, they hit each other, transfer energy, this guy comes down, this guy stay there, and this guy don't emit energy, don't emit photon. I mean. So we waste photon. This photon is, does, is useless. We don't have photon. So, okay? So it is very fast. Why? Because they're pretty close. And if you do a plot versus this Auger lifetime versus the volume of the quantum dot that's this direction actually going down, you see that the smaller the dot, the faster the Auger. That makes sense, right? Because the smaller the dot, the closer together are the, the electrons or the excitons. So the more likely than to see each other, more likely than to, to interact via Auger recombination. So this is a really fast phenomenon. And uh, you see, come down to like 10 picoseconds. And doing ultrafast spectroscopy, we actually can study that and see how that influences many things. And uh, the question is, someone would ask, is it good or bad having no geo recombination in materials? I would say, well, depend what you like. It can be good or it can be bad. I don't know, depend on you. So when Brazil lost to Germany, to 7-1 on the World Cup, someone can ask me if it's good or bad. <laughs> I think it was horrible, but ask a German. <laughs> uh, so depends a lot what you want. So the point is, care multiplication, which I'm going to talk to you next, is a very important phenomenon for solar application, if you want to create high efficiency solar cells. Okay? However, you can also get, because of Auger, or Coulomb interaction, you can get like huge binding energy in quantum dots, who can may help you to make like lasing. But on the other hand, if you have very fast Auger recombination, that's not too good because you start losing photons. So if you wanna, you wanna make, for example, LED or even a laser out of it, you want to make sure every electron counts. And because of Auger, one in every two, three, four electrons are going to count. So you start losing power uh, as you increase the, the, the number of uh, excitons. So I first am going to tell you some good story, the, the good part of it. And the good part of it has to do with the solar. And the weird, here is a school of optics. So I'm going to tell you that optics can solve the crisis problem. All right? But it's just simple. Just take the sun and make it work for us. Right? I don't know if you know, but the sun shines on us per hour enough energy for the whole humanity to use in one year. So listen, we're here worried about the oil, worry about the nuclear power. We should just use the sun for one hour and we're good for a year. Right? Why we don't do that? Because it has some other stuff to do, right? Heat up the oceans, create thunderstorms, and things like that. All right? But also, the other problem is like how we use this energy. Energy is coming. It's not a, yeah, right. the energy is coming, but it's then to be good use of it. And uh, if you look, that's how the first generation solar cell was uh, in the market. They were costing like about $3.5 per watt. That's pretty expensive. All right? If you want to make it, actually, if you want to convince me to use solar power, you need to tell me that it's cheap. Like $0.2 per watt, I would buy it. So we need to improve it somehow. And to improve it, we need to change how this is done. And actually, if you look, in the US, this is like 8% of the total energy used in the country comes from re renewable sources. And out of this 8%, you see here, only 1% is solar. Listen, it's not 1% of the total energy. It's 1% of the renewable energy. You know, this is nothing. And if you, like I said, if you look at the estimated realizable uh, energy, solar is the one that looks the best. But first, I don't know if you guys are familiar with how a solar cell works. If not, I'm going to show you quickly here. Basically, this is what the sun hits on us. 
That's the amount of energy we get from the sun. All right, that's the spectrum. And then here is this dashed part here has to do with how much a silicon uh, cell can convert in terms of usable power. And uh, if you look at the maximum efficiency in terms of the band gap of the material you use for a solar cell, that's the curve that the uh, shock equalizer limit uh, expect. And good enough, the silicon is right here at the top. Can get, but a typical cell gives you like 22%. That's the max, okay? And the reason is simple. is the way the solar cell works. So you have here a band gap, a semiconductor, all right? It's gonna have a part that the light goes through, that's transparent, so the gap is this big. So this light, the sun can shine as much as he wants. We're not gonna absorb. And then, if I take a photon this big, I absorb, but then it loses all this power, and the energy I'm gonna collect is at most this. At the end, it turns out to be less than that, but at most this. So you notice how much energy you lost? Dun, 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 dun. You waste a lot. So if you take a solar cell and make it with a larger band gap, this guy would come down less, but then you would have a transparency window that would be much bigger. And now if you make it to something smaller, all right, you could absorb all the light, but then you would lose all the energy. That's why if you go both ways, you lose, okay? We actually need to change the way this thing works if you want to make it more efficient. And one way to do this is using Auger recombination. All right? That we study using ultrafast spectroscopy. So why? Because if things goes one way, it goes the other way also. That's nature. So if I ha can have Auger recombination in the sense that I have two electrons or two excitons, I hit each other, I come down and this goes up, it means that if I start with an electron up there, this can come down. Instead of losing energy to the lattice, I just kick another electron up. So I end up with two excitons. And that's, that's why you call carrier multiplication or multi exciton generation. So basically, is the Auger upside down. And if Auger happens, that should happen also. That's physics. And uh, in fact, what, what would, the, would that do to solar? Basically, today, that's what happened, right? The electron goes up there, you have a hole. They, also, they will always going down, losing energy to the lattice. And then you charge. You take this charge out with much less energy you waste a lot of energy. What if, how cool would it be if I have this electron in the hole up there? And then as the hole comes up, it changes the energy and kicks another electron. And as the electron comes down, it kicks energy and kicks another electron. So it ends up with three. So we still collect less voltage per electron, but you have three electrons now. So, and actually if you work out the math, you see that the solar cell would go from Zero point uh, to like 31 percent efficiency max to like 42 percent efficiency max. That's an increase. If you look at the relative increase, it would be 30 percent increase, which is pretty good. So, and actually that happened. So someone may think that is just like magic. No, it's physics. It does happen. And if, you look, for example, in lead sulfide, uh, this is lead sulfide. This is lead selenide. If you look at these two materials. It does happen, actually. You see, this is a number of electron hole pair create per absorbed photon. It starts up at one, eventually you get up to three. You see? So with one single photon absorbed, you can generate three excitons. However, look at this. <laughs> you need so, many, so much energy that would make no sense. You need seven times the band gap. So if you take a, if you take a silicon solar cell with that, you would need <laughs> 7 EV, <laughs> good luck. You just, your solar cell is gonna work, you just need to move to another planet maybe. So, you know, that's the, or another <laughs> solar system because I don't think our sun is gonna shine there. So, that's the problem. It does work, but it's useless. So, the reason for that is that uh, here, you have, you need to conserve energy and momentum. You have fast intrabinary relaxation processes and uh, if you go ahead and work out the math, you will see that if you have this carrier multiplication, this is what happened in bulk, 
Okay, this is the shock equalizer limit, the black line that you barely see, you only see here. And here is the bulk. You see, you improve a little bit, which nobody would buy a cell because of that. But how cool would it be if we'd improve this much? Okay? So for that, some calculations has been done and see how the efficiency for this process has to be in order to get some of those type of uh, efficiency for solar cells. Uh, and then we come and discuss about, uh, about uh, quantum dots or nanomaterials in general. We see that momentum conservation is relaxed. I showed to you that, okay, funnel bottleneck actually doesn't exist. However, the frontal relaxation end up to be slower than if you have a bulk, if you relatively compare that. So that should work. And actually, we can measure that in quantum dots using our techniques. How we do that? Basically, what to do? We go ahead and excite the sun. Low power. We have a plateau here. Remember? Plateau, no OG. We crank the power, we started having the fast component showing up. OG. All right? Then I go to a wavelength where I expect to have current multiplication. And I do the same experiment. This is transient absorption. Here is transient pot luminescence done in the same sample. What we see? You see here? At very low excitation, I still have some kink right here. For the PL, you can see more clearly. For very low excitation, I still have the OG showing up. So for the very low excitation, I, no, I do not create, uh, or should I say, I did not absorb more than one photon. But since I have OG recombination, it means what? It means that I have at least two excitons in some material, okay? And uh, doing that, actually analyzing this ratio, A over B, I can actually tell you how many excitons I created per absorber with photons. So I can tell you how efficient the material is for this type of application. So we have done that for several sizes and types of nanomaterials. And we found out that, yes, you see, remember that seven that I told you when it kicks up? It's right here for the bulk. That's the nanomaterial, you see? It kicks up much, much earlier. You see, at about three, it already kicks up and keeps going up. So it's a very good improvement compared to bulk. So yes, nanomaterial has carrier multiplication, which is much stronger than bulk. And actually, in, when we put this in a solar cell, we actually start seeing this efficiency increasing because of carrier multiplication. So, Let's look at how this looks like in this charge, remember? I want it to be up here. So for this efficiency, if, you are, if I work out the math, I come to this, number four. <laughs> so I got all this work done by just this. This is not really good, okay? So, but when we did the experiments, we learned what's the physical mechanism responsible for this. And uh, from that, we you start to think that nanorods would work better than quantum dots. And the reason would be simple. It's because in spite, in spite of the fact that the nanorod is larger, and I was keep telling you that the confinement makes it better, when you generate an exciton, actually the exciton is confined in a effective tiny spherical volume. And then this guy can travel around the nanorod. And then you generate a second exciton, it might be generated somewhere else in the same rod. And it's gonna be traveling around. Eventually, they're gonna have OG. So OG is gonna get slower. However, when you have carrier multiplication, that not necessarily is gonna get slow because the carrier multiplication only needs one X not high energy, okay? So if we go ahead and measure carrier multiplication for nanorods, we actually see, this is quantum dots. We actually see for that we have better nanorods than quantum dots. So we could improve even f further. And to explain that, we have that idea that for carrier multiplication, we just need like a high energy exciton here and just need, need to meet an electron anywhere in the lattice. 
and kicks up. So you don't need to travel around to do that. All right, you have electrons everywhere. And if I compare this to quantum dot, this is the nanorods, that's the quantum dot, that's the bulk. So actually, I improve even further. I got here to number three. So you got to do like step by step, apparently. So if someone gets here to the number one, oh, great, you can open a company and start selling solar cells. I bet people are going to buy it. So actually, we didn't get to number one yet, but we actually coming close. And the idea of coming close is basically, remember when I told you that we can see how long does it take for the electron to come down from a higher lying state to, a, to the band edge? Those experiments I showed you right in the beginning when I told you that takes about uh, one picosecond. And that's a killer because it comes down pretty, e pretty fast. And uh, if it comes down pretty fast, I don't have time to find uh, my electron and uh, multiply it. I need to hold it. I need to say, hey, wait. Wait until you find the electron. Now you can go. You know, I have to do this. And uh, from our studies, we learned that if we make a core shell structure, this is the lead selenide. We put a shell around it of cad selenide. We manage, actually, to hold the hole here. Because we learned that the intrabandular relaxation for the cad selenide is faster than for the lead selenide. So it will eventually, when you generate somewhere where there is energy enough for both absorb the photon, the hole is going to populate the shell rather than the core. And then it's going to stay stuck here for a little bit. And we measure that using transient photoluminescence. And we got that this little bit is actually 10 picoseconds at least. See, 10 times is lower. So it would have time to find the electron. And if it finds the electron, would have time to kick it up. All right? And then we measure using transient photoluminescence and transient absorption. We measure the efficiency for this. And bang, there we go. That's the nanorods. Remember the nanorods? Now it looks so useless. You see? That's all the, the, the new heterostructure that we have worked on. And if we're plotting the same, the same data, this is the quantum dots, those are the rods, and here it starts showing up those heterostructures. And now if I try to plot in that curve over there, I can fit these points, and that's where it is. OK? So it's not even not on two yet, but uh, coming there. But for the first time ever, if you look here, let's go back once. See. We were in the number three. So you see, that's the maximum here. Even though we could increase a little bit, but we never beat the maximum. But now, for the first time, we beat the maximum. So we found a material. We Actually, we developed a material that would beat the maximum. So we're going towards that direction. So yeah, of course, there's a, still a lot to go. But that's an example. We don't want to kill OJ. We want to use OJ. So it's important that we understand how it works. We, we need to understand what are the physical processes involved so we can engineer the material towards that. Now I'm going to give you an example that we're going to kill it. OK? Uh, how many of you have heard about perovskites? Yeah, perovskites appear to be like the new thing, right? the new graphene. You know? Perovskites, yeah, that's the nightmare of everybody else that does not work with perovskites. Uh, so it appeared a few years ago as like huge promising for solar, OK? And the great thing about it was that the transport properties is pretty good. It's not absorption or anything. It's just a transport. Because when a solar cell to work, you need to absorb the photon, kick the electron up, and you need to take that electron. Yeah, all right, if the electron is up there, it's useless. You need to take it out to make good use of it. So you need transport. And perovskite shows to have ex excellent transport properties. Then we think, all right, we go ahead and some people go ahead and make quantum dots out of perovskite. Why not? They make quantum dots. They find these quantum dots to be extremely nice and bright. 
and then all right good transport bright narrow emission oh seems that we have a good led coming up but then they go ahead and make the led the led is so poor it comes up to be like 0.3 percent efficiency max 0.3 efficiency max can you think about that that's like useless and the reason for that okay we need to explain and uh, to explain that we have synthesized with our collaborators well i'm not saying that we have synthesized our collaborators have synthesized i don't know how to play with chemistry but uh, we have done this uh, several size, types and size of perovskites based on season and lead okay and we apply ultrafast spectroscopy to learn how the coulomb interaction plays a role here and what we see is that this is some transient absorption you see 200 picosecond time scale and we see again that OG guy cranking, cranking, cranking up right here and quite fast they're pretty fast and if I try to do a fitting here we're gonna see that the lifetimes goes like to 5 picosecond 12 picosecond 30 picosecond they are really fast okay but so what remember OG is fast means what means they were wasting photons if we're wasting photon in an LED, we're wasting the LED, all right? And uh, if we try to plot the by exon lifetime versus the volume, here is I say cross-section, but cross-section volume, they are basically the same animal, okay, for us. And uh, if I try to plot it versus the volume, I see that the by exon lifetimes <coughs> increase with the volume, but then it saturates somewhere around here. And... Uh, if I compare like different perovskite materials, I see this is like with iode instead of brome. You see like also very fast lifetimes here and they all fall in about the same curve. But these guys over here. So this is an example how we can learn physics rather than just see if the material is good or not for something. Because if you see, if you remember someone that was not sleeping 15 minutes ago, I said that OG recombination is faster as the quantum dot is smaller, right? Because they just can see each other much easier, all right? But listen, if you look at this, it's the true, right? You see these guys are coming, getting faster as the cross-section decreases. But these guys over here, it seems to be like breaking apart. They're not following the same trend. You see this, this, and this. And to try to understand this, we... We want to look first, look, linear dependence. So it gets faster as the smaller the quantum dot. And here is clear and obvious. But then there is this guy, this guy, this guy that doesn't really follow this. And then we go ahead and take this cross section and measure the volume and start seeing where is the extant bore radius. You, know, you guys know what's the extant bore radius of a material is? It is basically, you, have, you generate an electron in a hole. This is positive, oh, this is positive, this is negative. They're going to see each other. And they're going to be bounded to each other. Okay? And there is like a size for the exon. And that's what we call the Bohr radius. Okay? Until the nanomaterial has the size of that Bohr radius, it still behaves like a bulk because you can generate an exon here and an exon there. But now when you make it smaller, the exton bore radius doesn't have a, anything to say anymore because now you are already confined in a thing that is smaller than that bore radius. And then you calculate that. And look, this is the bore radius for one type of material. This is for the other type, and this is for the other type. And then we go and look, how, how does that overlap with what we have just done? And look at this. Isn't this magical? So we actually have proved that Auger recombination does follow this linear path with the volume until, but only until, the Bohr radius is reached. Once you reach the size of the particle that is larger than the exton Bohr radius, that theory doesn't work anymore. And you have shown this. Okay? And we can measure, again, lifetimes for, for by exon all the way down to five picosecond. But when you talk about biaxiton, 
I talk about lifetime, that's bad and stuff, right? But there's, there's another good thing about, oh, I was forgetting about this. So it turns out that you can have also a trial, which is not a bi exton. It's an exton plus a charge, not another exton. It's a charge. And this also can suffer with Auger. And that actually, we found out that this is what really kills LEDs. Because you can inject, when you make a film, you cannot make like a colloidal LED. Imagine like you have an LED that's a liquid. It doesn't make it too much sense. You need to make a film. When you make a film, you start to have this charged phenomena going on. And you see your lifetime start getting faster. And if you work out the math, with a situation like this, you would, ne you, you would never ever have a perovskite-based LED with efficiency better than 2%. Right now, it's 0 0.3. But I'm saying, this is the best case scenario. That's like 100% transfer. OK? So we, now, I can tell my colleagues in the chemistry saying, hey, guys, change the field. You're not going to get a better than 2%. And it's true, unless you engineer the surface, as I'm going to show you in a bit. But more than that, actually, it's pretty cool that I showed you that the Auger recombination is quite strong in perovskite. If it's strong, that makes it do some sort of a fancy ultra-fast decay, it might also be strong because imagine, if you have an exton, another exton, I have this electron seeing this hole. It is electron seeing this hole. But I also have this electron seeing this hole, this electron seeing this hole, this electron seeing this electron, this, ele this hole seeing this hole. So it's a mess. If you work out the math, you're going to see that Sometimes they want to repulse each other. Sometimes they don't want to repulse each other. They want to bind. Sometimes they want to anti-bind. And uh, we see this here that they want to repulse each other in perovskite. And it's pretty cool. You see, whenever here is time, this is wavelength. OK? Here, as the time goes before, when I first excited at low excitation flux, I only have like this Gaussian decaying over time. But now if I crank up my power, look at this. I start having a shoulder here. And this is where my bi exton is emitting. So you see, the exton emits right here. The bi exton emits right here. So I can separate energetically then. This I can observe easily if I do transient photoluminescence. And then if I take only this initial part here, you can clearly see that this shoulder increases with the power. This is due to the bi exton shift that we say. And uh, what we see for the perovskite is that it is strongly dependent on the size. If we go ahead and plot of, uh, this versus size, we see that this is huge. And when I say this is huge, it's really huge. Because if I compare to CAD selenite quantum dots, which is the test bed for any kind of quantum dots that we want to study, that's where it goes. It goes at 30. MeV, here we got to 100. This is a factor of three larger. OK? So this is pretty interesting. Because we can actually think that uh, perovskite quantum dots, in spite of the fact that it has pretty fast OG, it does split by exton and single exton quite a lot. That might help, for example, lasing with it. And in fact, some colleagues in Switzerland, they have just published this paper last year proving that. They have pretty low lasing threshold for perovskite quantum dots. And now we explain why. So we can use see, this. They don't even know anything about ultrafast spectroscopy. They're chemists. They don't know about lasers. Well, they know about lasers, but they don't know how to use the laser. <laughs> uh, I hope there is no chemists around. I'm joking. Uh, but uh, you know, they go and do the experiment for lasing. And of course, they see very nice and low threshold lasing for this material. And now, by understanding this by exton shift, we can actually explain that. Uh, well, one hour has gone. I don't know. Should we do a break or, or keep going? Keep All right. So. Well, this part is really connected to the second, to, to the one I was just talking, this one. 
So let me just finish this, and then before I go, then we can. All right. So there we go. So I think I convinced you that Auger is not a good thing for LEDs. It might be for solar, but not for LED, right? And this is a case that we can prove that very, very nicely. So this is cut selenite quantum dots. So our test bed, the one that we use just in the lab, because if you tell someone that you're going to sell them a cut selenite based LED, People are not going to like it because it has cadmium, and people think cadmium gives you cancer. So they're not going to let you buy anything cadmium-based. But I tr uh, trust me, it's not that it's not that bad actually. You can you can get you can get cancer by smoking. <laughs> no, honestly, there was a study saying that the amount of cadmium that there is on a on a 50-inch TV, cadmium-based for LED uh, quantum dot LED, that's it's going to kill you from cancer, but there's a limit. You just cannot You make sure you don't eat 10 TVs a year. You have to eat less than that. If you eat less than 10 TVs a year, you're fine. Really. So people say cadmium is too bad, but eh, there are worse things around. Don't eat salmon has cadmium. So anyway. This is cadmium selenide. That's our test bed. That the, the one that we know the best. That we know how to play with. And we try to understand best. So, our colleagues they made some LEDs out of it, and the efficiency, not that good. It's still like 0.8 percent. And again, this was already the second part of it because the the first one was 0.2. So this was already a good improvement. Okay. And again, we started blaming on Auger. And the funny thing is that if you take the photoluminescence in measuring solution, you get this. And you put on the glass, it goes down. And you put on the ITO, it goes down. And you put on the device, it goes down. So each step you go, it gets worse. All right? So let's understand this. And to understand this, we kind of propose the idea that let's try to kill OG. How we do that? Basically, we make a core shell structure in this sense that we have the conduction band pretty much aligned and the valence band totally disaligned. Okay? In a way that you're going to confine the holes in the core and the, the electrons can go everywhere they want. So they start seeing each other much less. So that would make the photoluminescence slower, but also would make the Auger recombination slower. Okay? So, and actually, we do that for a core shell structure like this with cad selenite and cad sulfide, and uh, we increase the shell thickness, we see the PL lifetime gets in, getting slower. So we prove it. All right? Good. That's actually has been known for about uh, seven years. So this gets slower. That's good. And then another step was like, all right, what if instead of making like a sharp edge between the cut selenide and the cut sulfide, I make it as it's going smooth. Okay? If we do that, putting a alloy in between, we, we do transient photoluminescence, and we see that we actually can get it slower. You see? This is sharp, this is not sharp. You see? 20 nanosecond, 20 nanosecond, pretty fast, quite slow. So we can get even better. All right? So I can I call my guy in the chemistry department and say, all right, fella, let's use this guy. Let's make LED out of this guy rather than that. OK? And he, of course, listen to me. And he makes the LED. You see, core alloy shell. Core shell. You see, it goes from 0.8% all the way to 1.8%. Factor of two improvement. That's simply because we killed OJ a little bit. And more than that, it's not only a factor of true improvement. Because as I keep increasing the pump or the current going to the LED, the EQE, you see, eventually goes down. Because when you put too many electrons there, they're going to have OG. And eventually, the OG is going to be fast. Because the more you put, the faster it gets. So then the EQE is going to 
it's gonna start to drop. But look, here it drops already here, but now it starts to drop further there. So I can put many more, I can increase my current much more, and that's still gonna have good AQE. But then you only, one is gonna tell me, all right, but this is not good enough. Yeah, I, I agree. And then we found out that there was two processes going on here. You see, a fast and a, a little bit slower. And then when you compare this a little bit slower process, seven nanosecond. Look at this, eight nanosecond. Oh, they look suspicious. So remember I talked to you about ionization, trions, this exton plus one charge? And that's where, uh, where you got the idea from, OK? Because look, this lifetime is so close to this lifetime. So then the, the idea was, let's try to kill this type of process by simply trying to avoid too many electrons to go in. And how we propose to do that? Actually, putting another shell. Uh, well, I only test them. The chemists, they have the whole work to do this. So I put another shell. This is zinc sulfide. So I would make a barrier that would not allow electrons just to jump there because they want. I just, with the electrons are just going to go there if I let them go, you know? It's just like a nightclub. Just go who I want. So basically like this, I, com I control which electron can go in, which electron cannot. And when I do that, bang, 8%. So look, I came down from 0 0.9, go to 8, by simply blocking the electrons that I don't want them to go up. And now I can measure the lifetime. You see, it does not depend on the voltage anymore. So I, can con I literally can control. And uh, the next step towards that is control even better. And to do that, now we get even fancier. Before we have a, a, a nuclei, uh, I'm sorry, a core and a shell. Now we're doing something here. Here is where the electrons are, and then the shell. So we call this a spherical quantum well. Okay? This is like the next step. So now we try to control, actually, those lifetimes by doing a further engineering. So before, it was confined like in the center here. Now we can separate them. And uh, once more, we can actually make the lifetime slower, like we said. <coughs> we can make, now we do transient photoluminescence, and you can get the Auger lifetime slower, OK? We can get all the way to almost like 10 nanoseconds slow. So the message I wanted to bring to you here, I know we're talking about optics, but all this we can do because we did ultrafast spectroscopy. We learned from this how we can do it. And now we're doing. And now we have actually total control of uh, both the fast and the slow OG lifetimes. We can basically control it almost independently. And uh, more than that, remember I was telling you about, you take the exciton, and then when you put the second X, it's going to see a, a little bit le uh, lower energy. But then I said that this electron sees this electron, this electron sees this hole, this electron sees this hole. It's a whole mess. And now it's pretty cool because we can control electrons and holes separately in a way that I can tell you if they're going to attract each other or if they're going to repulse each other. And uh, you s if you look here, and uh, if you want to agree with me, you can see that this is a little bit shifted that way in the beginning. Do you guys see that, or I'm being too positive? And this guy, you can see it shifted to this way. This you can see, <coughs> to you, right, in the beginning, right? If I, uh, if I measure this in the beginning and uh, after a long time, when you don't have multi exton anymore, and I plot the energies for the multi exton, what we can see is that it, if I change the shell thickness, you see it goes down and then there's a jump. It goes down and then there's a jump. It goes down, there's a jump. It goes down, there's a jump. You see this? So we found out that this jump actually has to do with this. As I increase the shell thickness, initially I have pretty much a line there right here. So I exaggerate, okay? This 
th this is the, the quantum well, this is the shell, but this line would be about here. Okay, it's very close. Not as, it just exaggerates so you can see it. All right? So as you, you change the shell size, you flip. So the shell is lower than the well. Because remember, as I make the confinement larger, or as I make the quantum dot smaller, the energy levels go high, right? As I make the shell larger, I make the states go down. So if I make the shell go larger, this thing goes below that one, OK? And that, I delocalized the electrons and the holes separately. So I change how electrons see holes, how holes see electrons, and how electrons see electrons. I control that. I control that so much that I can make them attract each other or repulse each other. I can make the attraction to be stronger or the repulsion to be stronger, OK? And uh, it's pretty sharp. You see, for one size of quantum well, it shifts for shell thickness right here. For the other ones, right there. For the other ones, right there. For the other ones, right there. So basically, now we learn this so much. We have control of this so much that we can have like a quantum dot on demand. You tell me what you want them to do, and we know where to go. And then again, I don't make them. I just sell. All right? Someone else make them, and we understand how it works. So this was all done in our lab using transient photoluminescence. So now we understand how to control electrons and holes separately in a nanomaterial. We can make them talk to each other in a way that we want. OK? Uh, so maybe I should open for questions, and then I, I keep going. For like, because that second part is much shorter. And I'm not going to say it's nicer, because but it's shorter. Couple questions? So we have a stretch. All right. I have a question. When is lunch? <laughs> At one. <laughs> so I have some questions about the part of the solar cell. Uh -huh. uh, something that I read in the past that for a solar cell to be used in the market, it has to work for a kind of 10,000 hours. So I'd like to know uh, for how many hours can you keep that high efficiency in your device? And I have a second question. It's what temperature do you measure those efficiencies? Because the efficiency of a solar cell decreases as we increase the temperature. Yeah. And now the thing is in the sun, so the temperature is going to increase for 20, 30 degrees. Yeah. How, how stable is your material? Well, uh, it's not my material. But, <laughs> but, uh, but when you say like how many hours it works, that sounds to be like so negative. <laughs> it works like for five or six minutes. <laughs> no. Actually, uh, I'm honest. Uh, that's all test bad, you know. That, that's not a solar cell that we put on the on the roof yet. Uh, depending a lot on the material you're using. For lead sulfide, they have shown a few days to be stable. The only the big problem for those materials is that they hate oxygen. Like oxygen comes to a lead sulfide or lead selenide or lead telluride and, and becomes like lead oxide right away. Kicks out the sulfide, for example. And that is not good. So yes, for now, if you just make it the way it is, it's not going to survive for too long. There are many groups out there in the chemistry department. They have been working on capping this to isolate. And uh, the tests are actually done in solar uh, simulators. So you basically have a, a lamp that simulates the, the solar spectrum with the same intensity and everything done at room temperature. So the same sort of uh, temperature changes that you would experience from the sun, you would experience from that solar uh, simulator. So it's the same. It, you put in the solar simulator is basically the same as you put on the roof at your house and measure it. The only thing is that that's not how we do it. So. But just a comment, like a, a silicon uh, uh, solar cells have the same problem. There's actually a patent from Unicamp that uh, if you put a um, a water um, a heater underneath, you can increase the efficiency by by five or five five or seven percent. Just on the side, next. I actually have a co a, a question. Mm -hmm. What about whole hole interaction? Hole mm -hmm. and hole interaction. You you said about a lot about the electron electron interaction. 
Well, actually, when when I say, actually, I, I plan to say electron, 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 whole, 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 if I didn't, because this, actually, we can separate how they behave, but we cannot, uh, like, you have to work out the math to see what's going on, actually, because here you have the whole holes trying to repulse, electron, electron trying to repulse, but this guy's trying to, trying to put together, you know, so this actually is the average out of every, everything. So there is whole whole repulsion. And uh, the holes actually, they are confined in this part, right? So I think the major difference here is that when you have the, the core, like uh, for that uh, initial, that's just a core shell, the, whole, whole, the, the holes are forced to see each other. Now they're not that like they're not that anymore because you can be confined either this side or that side. So you weakened it a little bit. So we're still working on the theory to try to explain that. Uh, and for the for this material, the effective mass also of the holes are larger or smaller than the electrons? Uh, they're larger. Any other question? Uh, what uh, what difference does bromide and iodide make uh, in the samples? So, oh, for change? the perovskites? Yes. Well, the iodide bring well. First of all, it decreases the band, okay, and uh, also changes the effective mass in the way that changes the exton bore radius. So, if you look for the in, on the from the application point of view is that with iodine you can make uh, devices operating in the, in, the, in the red, while bromide you can operate in the blue-green. Uh, if you look from the physics point of view, iodine is, uh, is a test bed for you to study in high confinement regime, just because it has larger exton bore radius, so you can achieve the high confinement in, with uh, decent sizes. And the bromide would be for us to study that low confinement regime, like a weak confinement regime, sorry, because the exon bore radius is pretty tiny. Okay, let's start the second. Oh, oh, there's one more. Uh, is it critical the quality of the surface between the core and the shell? Oh, yeah. I mean, the quality may uh, change the relaxation behavior. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, you want to make sure you have a uh, well, let's start. You, you want to make sure that you don't have uh, traps on the, on the interface. You want to make sure you don't have defects. Uh, and you want to make sure you can control for what you want. If you, you can control, like the guys, the chemist people now, they can control uh, even like how many layers of alloying you can have, like how many, what's the degree of alloying, or if you want to make a sharp. Uh, there is another story that I didn't tell here today. I'm not going to tell about today, but when you make a very sharp uh, interface, like you finish with cut selenite, you start with cut sulfide really sharp, you can, uh, it's similar to what happened for the car multiplication, you can lock the holes in the, in the shell in the way that the shell starts to emit. So you can have a material that emits in the red because of the cut selenite, and then eventually emits in the green because of the cut sulfide. So you can control by simply controlling how many, how much you excite it, if it's going to meet in the red or the green. And actually, from that, <laughs> we're able to make like a dual emitting LED, actually. By just, you control the, a single LED, you control the power, the, the, the current, you change it from going to red to green. It's pretty cool. So just, this is basically by surf, uh, interface engineering. Do you yes. Well, it's all well. It's all it's all colloidal synthesis. Basically, what they do, they start a well. I'm just gonna tell it very simple because that's how I understand. I'm not uh, I'm not uh, very good on that. But basically, what they do, they take a, a precursor, start to cook it at a certain temperature, then inject the other precursor, keep cooking it for another temperature. After cooking it, you have it. So it's yeah. <laughs> Well, but yeah, the details, you can find all those papers that uh, I have put in here, the reference, because uh, really, I try not to understand that. <laughs> okay, after master class, chef class, let's go to the second topic. All right. No, now we're going to change topics. And 
There you go. Okay.